Amen. Thank you, team, for leading us today. If you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. This morning we finish up the series that we have been in called It's Time. If you have been here, then you know that this series has really been all about getting us moving in the direction that God would have us to go in 2022. Many of us, we are at the stoplight of life and we are, we're not going anywhere. The light is green, but we're just kind of at a standstill. And so this series has been all about just giving you a little bit of honk honk to get you moving in the direction that God would have you to go. Week one, we, we saw or we discovered that it's time to, to go because the light is green. When a light is green, green means what? It means go. Week two, it's time to choose joy. Last week, we discovered that it's time to walk wisely, and today, we're going to discover that it's time to get together. The Lord has plans for you. The Lord has plans for you this year. Every day that you wake up this year, you can be sure that it's not without purpose. The Lord has plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. It's a verse that many of us know by heart. It's a verse that's just as relevant to us today as it was to the people of Israel back then. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. There is hope and a future for every person in this room today, for every person that's watching online. The Lord has plans. The Lord has plans to make you into something or into someone this year. The Lord has plans to take you somewhere this year. And here's what I want us to see clearly today. To reach the destination the Lord has for us this year, it's not going to happen alone. If we're going to experience the hope, if we're going to experience the future the Lord has for us in 2022, it's going to happen with others beside us on the journey. God made us to do life together. And I want to show you, and just for just a few moments, I want to show you some examples in scripture that that teach us that God made us to do life together first of all Ecclesiastes chapter 4 beginning in verse 9 says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor if either of them falls down one can help the other up the older you get the more you understand that verse amen when you're a listen when you're a child you know you fall down you bounce right back up but the older I get When I fall down, I'm glad that there is someone there to help me up. Solomon says, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And so that passage teaches us two are better than one. Life is better with someone else beside us. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, it says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. That's not by accident that Jesus, when he called those first disciples, he called two, and then he called another two, and then ultimately he called, you remember how many he ultimately called? He called twelve. And I, and I think what Jesus is trying to teach us, he could have just gone up to Simon and he, said, he could have just said, hey, Simon, follow me. But instead, 
He called out to Simon. He also called out to Andrew, follow me. James, John, follow me. And so ultimately, 12 men begin to follow Jesus. And I think Jesus is just trying to teach us that we were created to do life together. We're not supposed to, to journey all by ourselves. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says this, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Acts 2, 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Acts 2.46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So together, together, together. The Christian life is a life of togetherness. Following Jesus is about doing life with others, which brings us to Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to look and see what the writer of Hebrews says beginning in verse 30, or beginning of verse 23 let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful it was true then it's true today the lord is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together and if you are one who believes that it's okay to underline or highlight, I would, I would encourage you to just highlight or underline that phrase, not giving up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. It's, you know, it's becoming increasingly more common in our culture for Christians to not get together. And I don't know if you've, if you've noticed that, um, but it reminds me of a story that I, that I read of two sisters who were playing together when eight-year-old Martha insisted that they play school. Well, five-year-old Jenny wasn't the least bit interested in thinking about school but the older sister wouldn't take no for an answer. And if you have older siblings, you understand that. You understand that older siblings have a hard time taking no uh, for an answer. Well, finally, little Jenny, she conceded and she said, okay, I'll play. She then added, mark me absent. <laughs> now, unfortunately, now, that is the attitude that many Christians have today towards church attendance. You know, many are in the habit of not coming to church. Church attendance was, it was already on a downward trend before the pandemic. The pandemic simply expediated the decline. You know, those, those people who study uh, church growth and church decline, they were telling us uh, years before the pandemic that the trend was downward as it related to, to church attendance. In uh, 2018, Christianity Today, uh, in a Christianity Today article, Carl Vader's writes, and again, this is 2018, okay, so two years before the, the pandemic, he writes, church attendance is changing. As recently as 20 years ago, if 10 people became church members, either formally or informally, the average attendance grew by eight or nine people. That makes sense, right? You know, you, you find 10 people joining a church, usually you're going to see the attendance increase, right? At least by, by eight or nine. Today, uh, it's different. It's different. Today, if 10 people become church members, average attendance grows by five or six. Okay, so you, you see a, a change there. Here's why. According to Tom Rainer, about 20 years ago, a church member was considered active in the church if he or she attended three times a week. Many of us remember those days. I know, grew up. You know, you're an active church member if you went to church three times, three times a week, and we went more than that sometimes, you know, right? And, and that's how it was 20 years ago. Today, a church member is considered active in the church if he or she attends three times a month. Okay, so we see a cultural shift. In many places, it's even lower than that. These are not fringe people who are attending that infrequently. And these are not folks who have quit going to church. This is the pattern for active church members. Now, look back at Hebrews 10.25. It tells us that we should not 
give up getting together. In fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us that we should make church, att- church attendance a greater priority as we, re- as we see the return of Christ approaching. Now, I think most of us in this room today, we're kind of paying attention to our world. We look at how things are. Some of us are familiar with the signs of the time, right? And, and we look and we're like, you got to say that, that Christ's return is, is getting close. Here's what we know. Every day that we're on this earth, the return of Christ is closer, right? What's the Bible say? That we should get together more frequently, not less frequently, as the the return of Christ approaches. This is what the Word of God says. Now, you know, every day we get to make choices. Every day we get to make choices as it relates to the Word of God. Every day. And today... We can either believe a culture that tells us that going to church is not important, and that's what our culture tells us. Our culture says it's not important. That was a thing that people did back in the day. Our culture's changed, but the Word of God hasn't. So we can either choose to believe what our culture's telling us, and our culture's screaming at us. It's not important, it's not important, it's not important, it's not important. Or we can choose to believe what the Bible tells us, and the Bible says what? Oh, you guys are getting quiet on me. You guys are getting quiet. Don't get quiet on me. The Bible says it's important, right? I mean, you cannot read this and say that the Bible's saying anything differently. And so, Hong Kong, it's time to get together. It's time to get together. Now, some of you are saying, you're preaching to the choir today. We're here. And I'm glad you made the choice to be here today. I really am. I would have still preached, but it's a whole lot better looking into your faces and, and seeing those, those smiles and, and just knowing that the Lord is working in your hearts. So it's time to get together. And I just want to say this, more specifically, okay, more specifically, I believe that it's time to get together in a group. If, if, if you've been around almost four years, I've been your pastor in April, okay, almost four years, you know I talk about small groups a lot. Some of you are like, Here we go again. Yes, here we go again. You say, why do you talk so much about small groups? I talk so much about small groups because I believe they are important to our spiritual growth. I believe that they're important to doing life together, for caring for one another, to understanding what people are going through. This is great. I'm glad we get together. I want to encourage you to keep coming. Okay, keep coming. But my heart today, and I hope you know my heart, my heart today as your pastor is I don't want this to be about condemnation. I hope you know me by now. I, I'm not all about that. I'm not, this, this message is not about condemnation. It's about transformation. It's all about helping us see that God wants the very best for us. And I believe the very best happens in the context of coming together in a small group. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're not part of a small group here at North Nixa, you're missing out. You're missing out on, on God's best for your life, Okay. And we have opportunities. We have opportunities on Sunday mornings. We have opportunity on Sunday night, Wednesday night. Um, there's, there's small groups that meet during the week, uh, specific, like, uh, like women have a, have a Bible study. And, and hopefully there'll be more and more of that happen as we move forward because it's so very important. So I just want to say, honk, honk, it's time to move in that direction, okay? And I hope you hear the love in my heart that I have for you. For just a few moments, I want to I want to turn your attention to the life of David. Uh, in in Acts thirteen twenty two, we read this: After removing Saul, he that is the Lord made David their king. God testified concerning him: I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. I mean, that is quite a testimony given by the Lord about David. I mean, that's remarkable if you think about it. What a testimony! that is. And here's what I want us to see today. David did not become the man he became all by himself. David got to where the Lord wanted him to be with the help of others. Now, I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to say about me, I have found Travis, the son of Ed, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, I mean, don't you want the Lord to say that about you? Don't you want the Lord to say, I have found, insert your name, a man, a woman, after my own heart, they will do everything I want them to do. Listen, I'm not going to fulfill the plans the Lord has for my life. You're not going to fulfill the plans the Lord has for your life all by yourself. 
It's only when we, it's only when we get together that we're going to get to where the Lord wants us to be. It, it, listen, we need the help of others on this journey called life. It's how God designed it. And so when we, when we, when we get together as followers of Jesus Christ, when we come together in the context of not just here in this room, but when we come together in the context of a small group, I believe there are three things that should happen. And, and, and hopefully they do happen in the context of our, of our small groups here. And so I want to share with you those three things that happen when we come together. First of all, when we come together, we call out the best in each other. We call out the best in each other. Now, if you have your Bible, I don't do this all the time, but if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Samuel, okay? Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to be in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel for the rest of this message, okay? So 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning in verse 12. So he sent for him, and this is speaking of Samuel sending for David. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So the prophet Samuel he is grieving. The Lord has rejected Saul as king, and so he's grieving over that. And the Lord says to Samuel, why are you grieving? I've rejected him. I've chosen someone else. I've chosen one of Jesse's sons. I want you to go to Bethlehem, and I want you to anoint him. And so um, he goes to the prophet Samuel. He goes to Bethlehem, and when he, when he arrives there, the elders of the city, they're, they're alarmed because because sometimes when the prophet showed up in a city, it wasn't for blessing, it was to, to, to announce God's judgment. And so they're like, do you come in peace? And the prophet Samuel says, I have come in peace to sacrifice to the Lord. And so Samuel invites Jesse and his sons to sacrifice with him. Now Jesse has eight sons, but only brings seven of them to the sacrifice. David, David is the youngest. He is out in the, in the pasture. He's tending his father's, his father's sheep. And so what I want you to see today is that Jesse didn't see David as a king. I mean, the prophet shows up, says, I want to invite you, I want to invite your sons to, to this, this sacrifice. And so he says, okay, and he calls seven of them to come with him. He leaves David out in the pasture. And so, so Jesse doesn't see David as a king. David's brothers don't see him as a king. I mean, they could have said, hey, hey, dad, you know, we're missing one here. We've got a younger brother. He is the youngest. He's the baby. They don't even, they don't even invite him to come along. David himself did not see himself as a king, but the Lord the Lord saw a king in David, and he used Samuel to call out the best in David. You know, we all need a Samuel in our life. We all need to be a Samuel in someone's life. And I believe one of the things that should happen in the context of a small group as we come together is that we call out the best in one another. We live in a world right now, it's, it's, it's negative. I mean, everywhere you turn, negative, negative, negative. And listen, I believe when we come to this place, we ought to look at people and we ought to say, I, I call out the best in you. I see that God has a hope, that God has a future for you. I, I believe that God wants to do some great things in your life. We ought to call out the best in one another. I know that when I was a young man and, and I believed that the Lord had, had called me to be a pastor, to, to be a preacher of his word, there were people in my life that God used to call out the best in me. There were people who looked at me and said, we know that God has called you. We see that God has called you. And they, they just called out the best in my life. 
And I believe that that's what we should be doing with one another when we come together. We ought to be looking at people, calling out the best. There are people, listen, there are people, I believe this with all my heart, there are people in a small group, there is a Samuel that's waiting to call out the best for you. And I believe there's someone in a group that's waiting for you to be a Samuel in their life, and they're waiting for you to call out the best in them. And I believe it's so very important that we understand that when we come together, we should be calling out the best in one another. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. There's something that happens when you come together with God's people. As iron sharpens iron, one of the things that happens when we come together, we, 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 we sharpen one another. We bring out the best in one another. Second thing that happens when we come together in the context of a small group is that we call out courage in each other. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, beginning in verse 15, it says, While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. So David, he doesn't become king immediately. As soon as Samuel anoints him, David actually goes back and, and continues to, to take care of his father's sheep. And so David, he's there in the pasture, and his brothers, they are in the army of Israel, and they are fighting against the Philistines. They are fighting against a giant named Goliath. And one day, David's father sends him to check on their well-being and to bring them some bread and, the che and, and some cheese. And so, so as David is approaching the camp, he hears this giant calling out, as he had done day after day after day, mocking the God of Israel, defying, calling on someone to come and fight him. And he's like, what's going on here? Why isn't anybody, why isn't anybody accepting the challenge? And so he runs ahead and, and he begins to inquire. And if you know the story, then you know that he says, you know what? I'll take on this, this giant. The same God who, who delivered the lion and the bear into my, into my hand as I, as I watch my father's sheep, he will deliver this uncircumcised Philistine into my hands. And so he goes out, he uses his slingshot, he kills Goliath. But when that happens, as they begin to make their way home from battle, the Bible tells us that, that all the women of the cities begin to come out of their homes, they come out into the streets, they've got their instruments, they've got tambourines and all other kinds of instruments, and they begin to dance in the streets. And they begin to say, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul hears this, and it makes him angry, and he becomes jealous of David, and he, he's just purposes in his heart that you know what this this David's not going to stay around I'm going to kill him well David he he gets word that Saul's wanting to kill him and so he he leaves he goes on the run and here's what's remarkable about the heart of David even on the run David is still fighting for his people he's still fighting for his people David and a group of 600 men, they saved the city of Keilah from the hands of the Philistine. And Saul, he gets word that David is in Keilah, and, and he calls the people to go make war on David in Keilah. And so David, he asks the Lord, he says, are the, are the, are the men of Keilah, are they going to hand me over to Saul? And the Lord says, yes. They're going to they're gonna hand you over. And so David and, and his 600 men, they flee to the desert of Ziph. Now I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine how discouraged David must have been. I mean, put yourself for just a moment in David's shoes. Here's a man who's done nothing wrong. He has been, I mean, he fought a giant on behalf of the people. I mean, he was serving Saul doing everything he could to help Saul and the people of Israel. He saves the city of, of Keilah, and they turn on him and deliver him, or going to deliver him into the hands of Saul. Think about how discouraged he must have been as he found himself in the desert of Ziph. You know what that was? It was a desert of discouragement. 
He was in a desert of discouragement. And it's there in this desert of discouragement that Jonathan, Saul's son, comes to him. And the Bible says he helps him find strength in God. The idea here is that Jonathan spoke to David in ways that would infuse courage in his heart. Jonathan was basically reminding David to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Jonathan, he called out courage in David. We all need a Jonathan in our life. We all need to be a Jonathan in someone's life. You know, in times of adversity... When we find ourselves in the desert of discouragement, we need someone to call out courage in us. I mean, maybe you're here today and and you're discouraged. Something's going on in your life and, and, and you just find yourself discouraged. Listen, wouldn't you like to have somebody that would come alongside you and, and, and call out courage in your life? Somebody that would speak and infuse courage in your heart. Somebody who would say to you, listen, don't give up. Be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Keep fighting another day. I'm grateful for people in my life because I don't don't know about you, but there's times where I show up at this place and I'm discouraged. You ever come to church discouraged? I do. There's times that I come to church, I'm discouraged, things are going on in my, in my life or the life of someone that I know and I'm discouraged and, and I, I want to give up, but there's somebody that, that looks at me and they say, Pastor Travis, don't give up, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might, keep fighting another day. And I'm grateful for those folks. And we need to be that kind of person in someone's life. We need to... We need to Pay attention to people around us in small groups. And if we, if we know that they're discouraged, we need to listen, listen infuse courage in their, in their heart. Call out courage in them. And so when we come together, we call out courage in each other. Proverbs 7, 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Aren't you glad for those people that God puts in your life during times of adversity? They're great to have in your life. The third thing I want us to see today is that when we come together, we call out the truth to each other. We all need a Samuel. We all need a Jonathan. But we also all need a Nathan. 2 Samuel 12, 7 says this, Then David said to David, You are the man. Now, we're going to see that when he said that to him, he wasn't saying, you're the man. That's not what he was saying. David is now king. He's in power. And one evening, David uses his power in an unrighteous way. Sometimes when people find themselves in power, they use their power in an unrighteous way. And that's David here. David uses his power in an unrighteous way. He orders that another man's wife be brought to him. And he sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. And David uses his power to try and cover up his transgression. He orders for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to be sent home from the battlefield. David's plan is very simple. David's plan is for Uriah to sleep with his wife. And then when everyone finds out that she's pregnant, they will think that it's Uriah's child and not David's child. Uriah, however, is an honorable man, more honorable in this moment than than David. And he refuses to enjoy time with with his wife and the comforts of home while his fellow soldiers are camping out in the fields. And so David's in a predicament here. He's he's kind of in a pickle. He's like, what am I going to do now? I mean, my plan was that he would go home and sleep with his wife. He's not doing that, so what am I going to do? Well, David doesn't give up. He serves Uriah enough strong drink to get him drunk. And again, the hopes is that he, in his drunkenness, that he'll go home and that he'll sleep with Bathsheba. It doesn't work. Even in his drunkenness, Uriah is honorable. Well, finally, David, he uses his power to do the unthinkable. He sends Uriah to the front lines of battle. The reason he does that is because he knows if he sends him to the front lines of the battlefield that he's going to be killed. And so he sends Uriah to the front lines of the battle where he knew he would be killed. And David, he thought that he had covered up his transgression. 
but nothing is ever hidden from the Lord. The Lord sees everything. The Lord knows everything. There is nothing that we can cover up. God sees it all. It's true of David. It's true of us. And so Nathan is now the prophet. (laughs) And the Lord sends him to David to confront him with the truth. And the way that Nathan goes about doing this is is Nathan tells David a parable about a rich man who had many flocks, who had many herds, and he tells him about a poor man who had nothing except one little ewe lamb. And one day, a traveler shows up at the rich man's home, and the rich man, he is unwilling to take from his own flock. Instead, what he decides to do, he decides that he is going to take the poor man's ewe lamb and he's going to prepare it for the traveler who had come to him. This, this, this ewe lamb was like, like a family pet. I mean, it, it, it ate at the dinner table. I mean, it spent time with his family. And this rich man, he's like, I'm going to go and I'm going to take this little ewe lamb and, and I'm going to sacrifice it and prepare it for my guest. Well, after hearing the story, David's angry. He's angry at the rich man who did this, and he says, you know what? That rich man deserves to die for what he has done. And Nathan, he looks at David, and he says, you're the man. You're the one who did that. You are the man Now, here's what I want us to see today. If a man after God's own heart, David, can mess up, we all can. Every single one of us. And so it's so important that we have people in our life who love us enough to call out the truth to us. We all need people in our life, like Nathan, who will come and say, listen, you are not walking in the truth. You are not going the direction that God wants you to go. You're trying to cover up your sin. But listen, God sees it. And I'm here today to tell you that God has a better life for you. You need to change direction. We all need people in our life who will do that. We all need people in our life And I believe in the context of a small group, you can find people like that. Doesn't mean that everyone's going to be that person in your life, but I believe there's someone who will be that person. Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6 says, Better is an open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. It's those people like Nathan who love us enough to get in front of us to say, hey, you're going the wrong direction. If you continue down this path, it's going to be destructive for your life. You need to to repent. You need to turn around and begin to walk in the truth. We all need people like that who love us enough to speak the truth to us. The reality is we don't like it sometimes when it happens, right? Right? Have you ever had somebody tell you the truth? I mean, I mean, you, you, you weren't doing what God wanted you to do. You were, you were living a life contrary to the word of God, and somebody loved you enough to come, to come to you and call out the truth. And it wounded you. But the wounds of a friend, they can be trusted. And, and listen, years later, when, you, when your eyes were open and you began to, and you repented and you turned back to God, you look back to that person in gratefulness and you thought, thank God that there was somebody who loved me enough to stand in front of me and say, don't go this direction. We've all had those people. We all need to be that person to someone. I mean, I think all of us, we know that, that if there was, well, this, 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 this week, we saw a bridge collapse in, in Pennsylvania, right? Can you imagine, the bridge has collapsed. Can you imagine if, if, if no one just said anything? Who cares? You know what? It's their life. They chose to get on this road. We just let them just drive off and drive off and drive off. No, there were people there saying, no, 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 you need to turn around. You need to turn around. This, this, this is deadly. This is destructive. You don't want to go down here. If 
we would do that for someone's physical life, how much more should we do that for someone's spiritual life? And I'm telling you, at the end of the day, someone's spiritual life is far more important because, listen, we want people, we want people to experience God's best for their life. And, and, and we should be people who say, I love you, and I love you enough to tell you the truth. Anybody who'll just tell you what you want to hear, they're not your friend. They don't love you. It's those people who will speak to you the truth. Those are the people who truly love you. And so we need to be a Nathan. We need to call out the truth to others, and we need a Nathan to call out the truth to us. And I think in the context of a small group, there is, there's a Nathan waiting for us, and I believe there is someone waiting for us to be their Nathan. Again, we all get off track. There's not a single one of us in this room who's perfect, who gets it right. Listen, the enemy's always at work. He's always attacking. He's always saying, this is better. Walk this way, do this, do this, do this. And sometimes it looks good, right? Would you admit that up front, sin usually is pretty enticing? Here's how I know that. We would never go that way if it wasn't. It's enticing. Up front, sin is enticing. That's why we say, "Woo, I'm going to go down that way. And then we get down that way and we say, boy, this is not any fun at all. We need to be that person at the front end saying, I know it looks good. I know you think you want to go down this road, but it's deadly, it's destructive, it's not God's best for your life. We need to care enough and love people enough to do what God would have us to do, to be a Nathan in someone's life. So Hong Kong, it's time to get together. It's time to get together, it's time to call out the best in each other. Every single person in this room, there's a best life waiting for you. That God wants you to discover this year. And it's going to be discovered as other people are with you. And as we honk, honk, call out the best in each other, we need to call out the courage in each other. It's not going to get any easier. It's not going to get any easier. It's going to get hard. It's going to get hard. I don't say that, I don't say that to be a, a doomsday person. I just know the word of God, and I know that things are not going to get easier for so we need to call out the courage in each other. We're going to need people to say, keep fighting. Keep fighting for your homes. Keep fighting for your families. Keep fighting for what's right. We need to call out the truth to each other. The Bible says if you know the truth, the truth will what? Set you free. That's right. We all need to say it with that type of enthusiasm. It'll set you what? Free. It'll set you free. God wants every person in this room to be free. He wants you to be free to experience the life that he has for you. I'm going to ask that everybody bow their heads, everybody close their eyes, nobody look around. The most important decision that you'll ever make on this earth, it's the decision to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. The reality is that every single one of us were born into this world with a problem. The Bible defines what that problem is. It tells us what the problem is. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. The Bible goes on to tell us that there's a price for sin. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's what sin brings. Sin brings death. But it doesn't end there. For the wage of sin is death. If it ended there, that would be bad news, but the gospel's good news. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so God, he made provision for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he came and he paid the price for our sin. It's what the cross is all about. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8 that God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so if you're here today and, and you've never trusted in the provision that God has made for you, Jesus. But you'd like to, what does the Bible say that we should do? What should our response be? Well, Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Today, God wants to save you. He will save you if you just turn to him. So if, 
If it's the attitude of your heart, whether you're in this room or you're watching online, and you'd like, you'd like to trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation today, would you just say this prayer? Jesus, I know I have a problem called sin. And I know the price of sin is death. But Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth as God's provision for my sin problem. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. You shed your blood so that I could be forgiven of my sin. You were buried, and three days later, you rose again. And so today, by faith, I turn to you in repentance, and I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. Jesus, thank you for saving me today. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're in this room today and you just prayed that prayer just as a way to testify of your faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to do something. Not to embarrass you, everybody has their, their, their head bowed and their eyes closed. I want to ask you just to slip up your hand. If you just prayed that prayer along with me, would you just raise your hand up, put it right back down. Is there anybody in this room who would say, Pastor, that's me? Anybody at all? You're watching online. And you just prayed. There's contact information on the screen. I don't believe it was an accident that you tuned in to watch today. I believe it was divine appointment because God loves you and he wanted to save you. So I want to welcome you to the family of God. And if you live close here, we want to invite you to come and be a part of, of this church family and to, to walk with us. And we want, to, we want to do the things that we talked about today. But if you don't live close, here's what I ask you to do. Find a, a, a Bible-believing church that's close to you. Go to them and tell them of your decision, and they will help you. They will help you along in your spiritual journey with Jesus Christ. For those of you who are here today or you're watching online and you've already trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation, we come to the end of the journey of this series, and I just want to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit this question, what is it time for me to do? Based on everything that we've heard over the last four weeks, what is it time for me to do? Would you just ask the Holy Spirit to show you? And then as the Holy Spirit shows you, ask the Holy Spirit to give you the grace, the power that you need to be able to do what you need to do. Father, we say thank you again for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light into our path. Thank you that we don't have to walk around in darkness. We don't have to walk around wondering what direction we should go in this life because you have given us your word and you have given us your spirit to guide us and to direct us. But we have a choice. We have a choice if we're going to, to follow your guidance in our life. And I pray that we every day would, would make the choice to, to follow you in obedience. Father, help us to never take for granted the freedom that we have each and every week to be able to come to this place to get together with other believers. Father, help us to understand that there are people all around the world today, they don't have the freedom to do what we, that we get to choose to do. No one's telling us that we can't get together. We make the choice. But there are people in this world that that decision's been taken away from them. They don't have the freedom. They're, they're being told, you can't get together. And I thank you that even in those places in this world where, where people are being told that they can't get together, that they're saying, oh, yes, we can. 
And they're making the choice because they, they know your word and know, they know the importance of getting together. And so they're making a choice, even if it means underground, they're making the choice to get together. Father, help us to have that type of passion and that type of obedience that we would make the choice to get together and just see the value of doing life together. Thank you for every person that's in this room today, every, every home that's represented here, every home that's represented online. Lord, thank you that you do have plans for a hope and a future. And I just, I just pray that you would continue to go before each and every person and that you would help us just to trust in you. And I thank you that as we do that, you're going to make our way straight. Continue to meet every need. Move, work as only you can. And Father, we will be careful to give you all the praise and glory for you alone deserve it. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and ask these things today. Amen. And amen.